What up artists? My name is Dwayne Jones. I'm the creative director and founder of a lifestyle brand called Art Pays Me. This is the Art Pays Me podcast and I'm passionate about finding ways that people like you and me can make a living for ourselves off of our creativity and you know maybe we can make the world a better place at the same time. Let's get into it. All right, everyone. So welcome to Art Pays Me. This time I have a very special guest uh, by the name of Maurice Cherry. And uh, Maurice is coming to us all the way from Atlanta, Georgia. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So I'm going to give a bit of backstory here. How I came across Maurice. Ah, man, this is probably going back. You know what? I meant to listen to something, but I forgot to. I meant to listen. I was actually on Maurice's podcast a few years back. I meant to re-listen to it to see how much I've changed since then. But uh, <laughs> I'll, I'll go back. Um, so I came across Maurice because I was listening to this podcast called Adventures in Design. And they had a guest on there named Ashley Axios. And um, Ashley Axios was the creative director and digital strategist for the Obama White House. And she also happens to be black and a woman. So super intrigued, very uh, talented, intelligent woman. And um, as a regular listener to Adventures in Design, I always enjoyed it. But I got to the point where I felt like every episode and every guest was speaking from a very specific um, perspective and actually Axios is one of the few that weren't from that same perspective and by perspective I mean mostly white guys who grew up listening to punk rock or skateboarded um, I'm not that and um, a question can I think the host Mark is sort of aware of that but at the same time it doesn't change that often <laughs> and he brought he brought it up uh, to Ashley and when he, uh, she, he, he almost implied that there weren't that many um, black designers at the level he was looking for. And she said, well, you know, there's this podcast called Revision Path where Maurice Cherry interviews nothing but black designers. So if people are looking for talented black designers, there's a resource for you right there. And I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> <laughs> let me, let me look, let me look at, look this up. And that's how I found Revision Path, which is your podcast, which is a weekly showcase of black designers, developers, and digital creatives. So Maurice, welcome. Sorry about that long intro. I don't usually do that, but I just wanted you to, to kind of know, and I wanted to put that in context for my audience. So uh, yeah, what, what, what do you do, I guess? What do I do? Well, first of all, thank you for that intro. I had no idea that... Uh you had found out about the show that way. That's shout out to Ashley for, for uh, referring to the show. Yeah. Um, so what do I do? So my day job, I work for a software startup based out of New York City called Glitch. Uh, I work for them as their creative strategist. So I kind of do a little bit of everything from design work to marketing work to biz dev work to writing and editing. I do a lot of different things. I kind of wear a lot of different hats uh, right now at Glitch. And then of course, also, as you mentioned, I'm the, the founder and the host of Revision Path, which I've done now since 2013. 2013. So how many episodes is that now? Uh, oh, so as of now, as we're recording, it's 300 and oh my God. <laughs> so episode 330 is out right now. Yeah. I've recorded up through episode 338. Okay. Uh, plus we have three bonus episodes. So like 341, like something like that. So yeah, there's a bunch of episodes I've recorded that they'll come out in February and March that are just, you know, waiting in the queue. Indeed, indeed. And um, I have to, again, thank you because after... You know, soon after I found out about Revision Path, uh, once I shook off some imposter syndrome, I reached out to you and asked if I could be a guest, and you gracious, graciously accepted me. And um, I wasn't 
anybody famous or doing anything incredible or anything like that, but like you gave me a chance to start articulating myself and what I do and sharing my story. And from then I've gone on to do a lot more. So I really appreciate um, that little confidence boost at that point in time. Um, so what moved you to start Revision Path? So I initially had the idea to start Revision Path back in 2006. Uh, I had the idea when I was working on another project of mine uh, at the time, it's called the Black Weblog Awards. And what that was, was basically like a annual internet award show where I give out awards to uh, bloggers and video bloggers and podcasters. Uh, and I had started that in 2005 and then kind of just, you know, kept it going until 2011. Then another company bought it out for me and then they kept it going until 2017. But uh, in 2006, there was a category called best blog design. And I was a working designer at the time. I was uh, actually just leaving working for the state of Georgia and starting to work for AT&T. And I had friends of mine who were designers that were doing like some really great projects like designers working at Vibe, designers working at, you know, some of the top record labels, designers working on really big, you know, visual pieces or big, you know, sort of graphic displays and things. And they weren't getting any sort of recognition or attention for their work. Um, you know, some of these were friends of mine, some of these were just colleagues, but I think we all saw when we looked at, you know, the design media of the time, we just weren't there. Like black designers in general were not there, not just, you know, those specific people. But yeah. so I had the idea to start it then, but I was, you know, in school full time. I was in graduate school. I was taking, uh, I was doing 40 hours a week for work. Plus I was doing the black web blog awards in my spare time. So I was like, I don't have time for this. It wasn't until seven years later that I really had the, I guess, perfect uh, combination of elements for me to start this. Because at that time I had left my job at at and I had started my own studio. I had done that successfully for five years. And I was at a point where I was like, yeah, now's the time for me to kind of do something new. And so that's when I really sort of had the idea to start to do Revision Path. I learned a lot of lessons from doing the Black Weblog Awards that I put into Revision Path, um, largely around basically how I name it and how I market it. I think with the Black Weblog Awards at the time, I was a lot more kind of brash and in your face about things. <laughs> and, I, and I felt now doing Revision Path, I needed to be a bit more... I mean, I think still brash, but just in a different fashion. So mm -hmm. like one of the big issues that I have with the Black Weblog Awards is that people wouldn't take it seriously because Black was in the title. Right, right. And so because Black was in the title, this was also sort of, I think right around the time Obama was getting elected and was campaigning. And so everything here in the States was, you know, post-racial. So anything that had any specific racial implication, particularly if it was Black or Brown, was sort of frowned upon like, oh, how could you do, how could you do that? How could you segregate yourself? It, you know, we're in a post-racial society, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so when I started Revision Path, I didn't want to have black in the name because I was like, I don't want to turn people off from the message and from the, the folks that are here right off the bat. And if there's a sly way that I can get people interested just by us, you know, a little name change, it shouldn't be a big deal. And so revision path is something which uh, for me, I felt had different meanings for design and for development. So of course, you know, in design, you have multiple revisions of a file. If you're doing something in a vector based sort of image tool, you're making paths. So like revision path in that way, but then also for software, software, especially if you're like on Git or, or a similar type of a platform, there's different versions, version control, different revisions of, uh, you know, a piece of software. And then also there's a path, which is a directory to a specific file. So I was like, oh, these, you know, these two together kind of sound like something which could either be taken in the design way or it could be taken in a, you know, kind of development way. It wasn't until after I really started doing the show that I was able to sort of craft a narrative around the path of someone's sort of journey as a designer or a creative. Yeah. And how learning about these people who might not be featured in regular design media is sort of a revision from that path. So 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So something I've, um, I've probably listened to every episode at this point. Uh, and something I found interesting that seems to come up that you've uh, mentioned is there are people that you reach out to specifically and they don't feel like they're accomplished enough to be on the show. Mm -hmm. And like, do you feel that um, that sort of imposter syndrome that some of us have is, is kind of directly tied to the way black designers have been kind of hidden from the, from history in, in a lot of ways? Um, I would say yes and no. So I would say yes, because certainly I try to have people of all different like career levels and such on the show. Like I'll have students on the show. I'll have people who are at the top of their industry because I want to have those different perspectives being shared mm -hmm. because someone who's just starting out in their career, of course, they could learn a lot from someone who's been in the game for 20 years. But then honestly, someone who's been in the game for 20 years can learn a lot from people that are just getting into the field now. Yes. So I want to have a good mix of just levels of where people are. So when people say, oh, I'm not ready, you know, interview me in two years and I've been such and such, I'm sort of a little dismayed because I want to talk to them where they're at now. Like the perspective that they have now or the place that they're at in their career, that's what I want to talk about. Like what does, I'll give you a prime example. Uh, I had an interview back in December, episode 325 with Chanel James. And we were talking about the concept of being sort of quote unquote mid career in your, you know, in your design career or in your, you know, kind of development career. Yeah. And like, what does mid career mean at a time when technology and innovation is changing the field pretty much every day? Like, what does it mean to be in the middle of your career? Because we don't really know what the end of this sort of career looks like, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's, you know, designed for what it's worth, at least in this sort of modern technological sense, it's still fairly new. And every, I'd say every year, there's like a new type of design position that you can do or a new type of way people are using design thinking. And so designers can be pretty malleable in what they do with their career. So it's hard to pinpoint what the middle looks like. Gotcha. Uh, to that end, when I was speaking with her about it, she's like, yeah, I've, you know, just graduated school a few years ago and I'm working, I'm kind of like a mid-career designer, but it's like, what does that mean? Like, does that mean that your career is only 10 years long and you're at the five year mark or like it's, it's hard to, to gauge what that means. And so when I'm talking to people on the show that are at all different levels, those are the kind of conversations that I want to have because someone who may be at the top of their field might not be able to really even like see that, mm -hmm. let alone articulate it in a way that I think the audience can sort of recognize. So I, I try to have folks at different levels. So for that, I would say yes. I would also say no, because there's still a, a large pervasive level of systemic, you know, racism and bias that exists in the design and tech communities in general. I mean, from hiring to coverage, et cetera, that still exists. And I think even, you know, those designers out there who are doing the most that are getting the press or that are, you know, really out there doing these big visual things that aren't getting recognition, I don't think that has anything to do necessarily with imposter syndrome. It's honestly could be because the, the masthead of this particular magazine doesn't think that what they do is worthy or doesn't mm -hmm. think that it's good enough for whatever reason, you know, and oftentimes that does unfortunately boil down to race. I can say that pretty definitively for the few design pubs that are out there. Like at the end of the day, it boils down to race. It doesn't necessarily boil down to, whether or not something is design worthy, because all of these publications are scrambling for content. Right. So it, it, it really didn't have anything to do with like, oh, we don't know if this is where, it's, it comes down to race. I find that it's, it's funny, like you mentioned the vibe thing too, because uh, I used to read a bunch of design magazines and those kind of, that, that whole black, if you can call it a black aesthetic, I don't, there's it's debatable what that actually is or if it exists but um i'll use vibe magazine specifically like the aesthetic that they had um it wasn't really paid attention to that much and then i started looking at design magazines like maybe 
past that heyday and they were starting to get acknowledged and celebrated as design revolutionaries in some ways, but this was already at the point where uh, black culture was starting to be celebrated widely. So I, I find it interesting that people go back in history and now say, oh yeah, that was actually good. Um, but like when it's happening, it doesn't get acknowledged sometimes. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, to talk about Vibe Magazine, I mean, unfortunately, they had their final print issue, what, six years ago, I think? 2014, yeah. something like that. Um, and I mean, I, I grew up in rural Alabama, and so magazines were the only sort of big outlet I had for design. Like, we didn't, we had, well, I don't say we had the internet at home, because we didn't. But like, if I went to the computer lab at the local community college, or if I went to the library, I could get on the internet, on the one computer that was available. So magazines like Vibe, Source, YSB, Emerge, you know, et cetera, those were sort of my gateways into what design looked like in a way. And yeah, you're right. Like I see so many different sort of features on like, you know, the design of Rolling Stone and, and, uh, <laughs> and similar types of, of magazines, design of Spin Magazine, but then you know, something like Vibe or Source is left out of the equation. And like a lot of those designers are still around, still doing great work. I've had them on the show. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's, um, it's sad. I think when I actually came across that was, I think it was around the time Vibe announced it was sort of closing up and one of the design magazines did a special on it. It was like, ah, oh, you know what, actually, that's like, really, why does it take this now for you guys to say that? I mean, mm -hmm. all this time, like, see, I, I, when I went to school, a lot of the um, uh, European uh, aesthetic was, was kind of cele more celebrated, the Swiss design, minimalism, et cetera, et cetera. And I also grew up in, like, um, I'm from Bermuda, but, like, there's a lot of overlap in terms of uh, dancehall, hip-hop aesthetic. Mm -hmm. um, in party flyers and magazines and things like that that we um, were first exposed to in design and I remember starting to turn my nose up at that kind of aesthetic when once I was in design school and then uh, it took me some years to kind of come back and realize the fuck like I'm dismissing my own culture and and um, not recognizing the value in it because I bought into this European system of whatever and, and now i'm questioning everything <laughs> everything yeah. um but yeah it's it's kind of sad how that happens um yeah i mean there's there's like decades of research by all kinds of like <laughs> cultural theorists that show like this widespread misrepresentation of black folks in mass media so that doesn't surprise me mm -hmm. yeah so what are your your thoughts in terms of like today representation today versus when you first started revision path do you see any improvements um i think i see hmm i see more cognizance of the issue i think that you know there needs to be black designers or there need to be more diversity in a you know a jobs hiring pool or candidate pool etc i'm seeing a lot more calls for diversity which is good i think i'm also seeing probably diversity fatigue <laughs> uh, from, from companies and organizations that have, I guess, tried it and maybe for, you know, whatever reason or another have not been able to attract the diverse crowd that they wanted. So they kind of just gave up on it. Mm. Um, I, I certainly do see more black designers out there in the market in terms of media conferences, just like design and creative opportunities. I see that so much more now than I did when I started. Yeah, I I kind of I, I I noticed that too. There seems to be at least one typically now in the big big push for events lately. Um, so I'll take it back. Uh, you grew up in Selma, Alabama, I believe. Yes, that's right. Same one from the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the same one from the movie. Although honestly, they didn't shoot. Uh, from what I remember, they didn't shoot much of the movie in Selma. 
Okay. I think they maybe shot the bridge scene, I think. I actually haven't seen the movie, but that's because I'm from Selma. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to. <laughs> I'll be looking like, wait a minute, I know that. I know that, that intersection. Yeah. Right, right. So what were you like as a child? Were you like sort of always creative? I knew you, you had a musical background. Um, so I, <laughs> I feel like my mom could probably answer this a lot better than I could. But I, I, when I think back to my childhood, it was a mix of, um, hmm, that's a, good, that's a really good question. I want to say that I was a pretty creative child. But also, I was in a, a school system that really didn't know what to do with gifted children. Oh. Um, so in that respect, there were, I think, a lot of different things that happened, maybe just in my, you know, matriculation through, you know, primary school that was not the best. But then again, it's also rural Alabama. So, like, yeah, it, it kind of is what it is. Mm. Um, so, like, I was in gifted courses from like second grade all the way through 12th grade and like they created the curriculum for me and two other students that were like I guess by the state were shown that were gifted and so it felt like there was a lot of experimentation and trial and error uh, in terms of like what they would teach us and so to that end I ended up learning about a lot of different things at a very young age, like I was really big into writing. I did a, a lot of writing and drawing. Um, I started learning French when I was in second, was that second grade? Second grade, I started learning French and continued that like all the way through college. I don't think those are things I would have been just readily exposed to if I was just going to school regularly. Mm -hmm. Outside of school, certainly I was, I was probably precocious is a good word. My brother is, I have an older brother, he's four years older. He's the real artist in the family. He draws, paints, sketches, sculpts, like super talented. Like I, I don't have any of that artistic talent at all. Okay. He's, he's a great, great artist. Um, and I, rem and I, I remember trying to be like him, like trying to draw like him and getting frustrated that I couldn't draw like him, but I would just write. So I did a lot of writing and just like whatever crude drawings accompanied the writing. I didn't start getting into music until about, when did I get into music? That was seventh grade. And the reason I did it is because the band students were able to get out of sixth and seventh period to go practice. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, so I can like not be in the last two periods of the day and just like do something else. <laughs> I'm gonna try to learn an instrument. And I wanted, uh, I think when I started off, I wanted to learn the saxophone. I didn't pick up the saxophone very well. And then I started to learn the trumpet and I didn't pick that up very well. And it wasn't until I started on the trombone that I was like, okay, this is like, this is my instrument. So I played trombone from seventh grade uh, all the way through college and played for a few years outside of college. I don't play anymore, okay. but I played for a long time like marching band symphonic band i was in a jazz band for a few years uh, when i was in high school i did like some pickup stuff around town when i was like in my early 20s or so mm -hmm. um i don't do it now but yeah as a kid i tried out a lot of stuff if i was doing computer programming on basic uh my my brother had this uh i had basically got this hand-me-down computer from him called a laser 50 from VTech and it's shaped pretty much like a standard keyboard, okay. except instead of the, the F keys at the top, the function keys, there's like a one line sort of dot matrix screen and you can do programming on there. And the laser 50 came with all these different accessories, like a tiny printer. And it came with a, <laughs> it came with a quote unquote hard drive in which you put a blank cassette into <laughs> because that's how it would store, it would store the tape and you could have all these little accessories to it. And, that, that was when I started learning like basic programming. And then when I got to, I think second or third grade, we had Apple IIe's. And so that's when I was learning DOS and was like, oh, I could use basic on here. And so I started learning little computer graphics and computer programming stuff there. Uh, when I was in like high school, middle school, going into high school was when I first, well, that was when I was first exposed to the web. My computer, my, uh, High school had a supercomputer lab from the University of Alabama in Huntsville. And so we would go in there and that's when I first, 
My first browser experience was with Netscape Navigator. Okay. <laughs> uh, learning how to use that and uh, figuring out how they, how the web pages were built by doing view source. And so that's how I sort of taught myself HTML. Um, yeah, I, I tried a lot of different stuff when I was a kid. I did origami. I was in the math club. I did a bunch of stuff. I, and shout out to my mom for honestly giving me the space to do all of that weird and crazy shit because, <laughs> because like this is, this is rural Alabama. The only things people really do there are like go to school, go to work, go to church, and that's it. Yeah, were people like looking at you like, what are you doing? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. All <laughs> the time. All the time. Um, my mother and my grandmother were also both seamstresses, so they taught me how to sew. Uh -huh. And so from second grade through, I think second through fifth grade, I was doing like cross stitch. Like I, I picked up a lot of stuff when I oh. was a kid. Um, I, yeah, shout out to my mom really for letting me have the, the space to try out a lot of things. Um, and not really ever saying no. Yeah, I think if, if anything, she would maybe delay something, but like it would never be like a flat out no. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. Cool. And then you ended up being a math major. Yeah. College. Yeah. So I, I went to, to Morehouse College. Um, and I'll be, be honest in saying that Morehouse was not my first pick. It actually wasn't even on my, on my radar at all. I wanted to go to like Stanford or uh, Harvard, Stanford or Harvard. If there was any HBCU I wanted to go to, it was Howard. Mm. But my mom was very much like, if you go that far away, like I'm not flying there, like you need to go somewhere close or, you know, what have you. Right. And Morehouse happened to show up on my senior awards day with a scholarship for me. And it was the highest amount that I had received. And so I was like, well, I guess I'm going to Morehouse then. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I say that to say like <laughs> it wasn't my first choice. Not that I didn't like the school, but like it wasn't something that I aspired to. I knew of Morehouse's reputation, yeah, because of you know Martin Luther King Jr. and et cetera. But I wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go there and be a Morehouse man. I, if anything, I was thinking I want to leave Selma and go somewhere else. And like right. Atlanta was the next biggest city that everyone in the South kind of was drawn was drawn to, especially in the nineties, yeah. uh, because of freak Nick and because of the Olympics. So a lot of people were drawn to Atlanta in the South. We went to Atlanta every year, uh, like in, in high school, just as like a, uh, like a trip. Like they'd always take us to six flags over Georgia. So Atlanta was always like this touch point where I was like, well, if I go anywhere, I'm going to go there right. and then I'll just kind of figure it out. Mm. So I started at, I started at Morehouse, uh, the summer of 99, did a, a program there with uh, NASA who had basically funded the scholarship. And then I started that August uh, as a dual degree major, computer science, computer engineering. And I hated it. I did not like it at all. I wanted to be like Dwayne Wayne from a different world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like I had that in my head as sort of like, this is what a computer programmer is, which I mean, you also have to think about it. That's, that's pretty subversive for that time. Because sure. if, if you think now, I think when, when, especially with this whole like black and tech movement and now folks are like, oh, they want to be the next Zuckerberg. I was like, I was trying to be like Dwayne Wayne. That's crazy. I wasn't trying to be like, you know, some Poindexter on <laughs> from Revenge of the Dirds or whatever, you know? Yeah. Uh, but anyway, so yeah, go to Morehouse, want to be like Dwayne Wayne. But I was also learning web design and, you know, HTML and stuff. And I remember going to my advisor in the computer science department and telling him that this was what I wanted to do. And he's like, oh, you know, the internet is just a fad. Like, <laughs> it's a fad. You don't, you, you don't want to do this. You really don't want to, you know, go down this route and do this. Like, if this is what you want to do, you should probably think about changing your major. And I was like, oh, well, I guess I'll change my major, which I did. I was looking at my credits and seeing what I could transfer to that I could still stay in the program as well as, you know, possibly get out a little earlier. And so math was it because I took uh, AP Calc when I was in 12th grade. Mm -hmm. So I had credits for that. And I also took Cal 2 during the summer during the program. So I was able to start out at a sophomore level as a freshman. And I 
was able to graduate a little bit early. So I was like, cool, this, this all works out. Plus, I like math. I was captain of the math team in high school. So it wasn't like it was a huge stretch. Um, but I was not doing it out of – I won't say I wasn't doing it out of love for math. I really do love math. But when I was switching, I was mainly thinking, how soon can I get out of here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> not necessarily like what are the collateral benefits of getting a mathematics degree, which – I soon learned once I graduated were not uh, as good as I might have thought they would be. Okay. Huh. Curious. Did you, did you meet any people from Bermuda while you were there? I'm sure I did. I mean, Morehouse has a big international student population, particularly from the Caribbean. I know I met folks there from Jamaica, from Haiti, from St. Lucia. I probably have met some folks from Bermuda. I yeah, probably like, have. That whole, like, because we have a few places that we send people, uh, Nova Scotia, where I ended up, uh, the South, because people love the HBCUs and they don't want to be in the snow. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and then uh, London. So like a lot of that, like Southern American culture has started to come back to Bermuda, like people are stepping. There's a lot of people doing the fraternity things that they brought back from their HBCUs and oh wow, the alphas and megas and all that kind of stuff or whatever. So uh, it's it's interesting, and, um, and uh, a lot of people still just go to Atlanta for fun. I, I've been to Atlanta a couple of times. I've been to Atlanta yeah. as well. Um, so you ended up doing going on. You were the, the math major, and like. How did you then, like, you started your own uh, design agency, Lunch. Where did, how did that, like, come into play after the NASA and and all of that stuff? Yeah, so that's an interesting, uh, and again, this is, this was me in my 20s with no real sort of direction. It was me just sort of trying to find, like, what is, like, what's my path? Like, what's my way to get to where I want to go because I graduated from, so I graduated from Morehouse in 03. Uh, at the time I was working customer service at the local symphony selling tickets at the box office. So it's not like I really had a career plan after college. Well, let me take that back. I actually have to go back even a little bit further. So the conditions of the, uh, the NASA scholarship with Morehouse was that you would intern for two years at two NASA facilities. And then upon graduation, you would be slotted into like a position at a NASA facility of your choice. Mm. So I did an internship at Ames Research Center out in Moffett Field, you know, doing robotics education. Then I did a internship at Marshall Space Flight Center in Normal, Alabama, which is near Huntsville, like North Alabama, um, doing like human factors engineering, stuff like that. Actually, that's where I saw my first 3D printer. This was in 2001 because they 3D print the nose cone of the space shuttle. Like it's made out of this um, material car, called Marcor, and the, the nozzle burns up on reentry into the atmosphere. Okay. So that I got to see like the first 3D printer there, like the, how they make the nose cone. That was pretty cool. Ooh, yeah. um, but then 9-11 happened. And so when 9-11 happened, they ended up pulling the funding for my program. And I had no sort of... Uh, idea as to what I was going to do after college. Because for me, I was thinking, oh, I'm set. I'll just go work for NASA. I'm good. Mm. And then, you know, come junior year, I remember I was in Kilgore. For folks that are at Morehouse, they know this. I was in Kilgore studying for a test. It was my, it was an abstract algebra two test. And I was watching the towers fall on one of the TVs. And um, I think we had a meeting maybe about two or three weeks later where they were explaining like, you know, what's going to happen to the program and everything because funding was going towards Homeland Security. So I had nothing lined up after, after college for a career. At the time I was sort of getting in good with people in the computer science department, the the secretary there, Mrs. Banks, shout out to her, her and I were really close. And so I would sort of work on a, honestly on a pro bono basis, just so I could be around computers. I would just hang around the lab and sort of serve as an attendant and stuff like that. Not in a a work study capacity just to do it. Um, And so with me having that access in the computer science department, I knew that they were doing interviews like Microsoft would come and interview and real player and a bunch of other companies. And they had this book basically like 
the majors had to sign in this book for different interviews they wanted to do. So because I was in the computer science department and I was close to it, I could get access to the book. So I would just slide my name in there right along and I would get an interview with some of these companies. None of them panned out, but it was better than nothing. Uh, basically, I graduated uh, from Morehouse with my math degree and then went the next day to work to sell tickets. And they had taken the calculator away from my little kiosk thing mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, well, you don't need this now because you have a math degree. Like you can do it in your head, <laughs> which I could, but like, come on. So <laughs> I, I did that for a few months and then I, I, I got fired from there actually. And uh, then I was working a customer service job at Auto Trader, got fired from there. Um, <laughs> and it wasn't until 20, not 2015, 2005, when I got my first design gig, like for real legit design gig, I had applied to a position in the back of our alt weekly here called creative loafing. And it was the state of Georgia. They were looking for an electronic media specialist. And I was like, Oh, let me, you know, let me just interview just to see. And it turns out that the person who had the position before was a Morehouse graduate. And so I was like, oh, okay. So I, I don't know if that played in my favor or not, but it kind of did, I think. Um, and so I ended up working there for about a year and a half. I left there, worked at AT&T, worked at WebMD, worked at a couple of places around town up until like 2008 or so. And at this time I was working at AT&T as a senior web designer. I was being underpaid. I knew I was being underpaid. I hated it. I had actually put in a request to get back pay because I found out that I wasn't receiving the salary I should be receiving based on the work that I'm doing and my title. Damn. Ended up getting my back pay. Once it hit my account, I quit that job. <laughs> so this was maybe like two weeks after Obama got elected. Mm -hmm. And I was feeling, you know, all that yes, we can energy and, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and had some money in my account. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. Uh, and that's how, that's how lunch started. Although when I first started, it was called 318 Media after my birthday, March 18th. Mm -hmm. So I, I started out with that. Uh, those first two or three months were a little rough. I ended up uh, connecting with two local entrepreneurs who were sort of trying to finagle their way into the, the mayor's race at the time. Mm -hmm. So this is the first set of municipal races after Obama got elected. This is 2009. And by this time, every political candidate that was running was trying to figure out a way to get on the internet because Obama's early campaign was very much about, you know, great design and utilizing social media and, you know, getting out there. And so all these candidates were like, I want what Obama has. I want to do that. Mm. And it's like, well, the only people that really know how to do that were the people on Obama's team. The rest of us are just trying to figure it out. You're right. <laughs> uh, but we had, I guess, you know, convinced uh, enough people, at least the candidate who we ended up working for, to do work for her campaign, Lisa Borders. We did work for her mayoral campaign throughout 2009. Uh, she didn't win. She came in third place. But I learned a lot about, well, one, just local politics, but two, sort of how to make connections with people mm -hmm. on a business level that, you know, I wasn't doing before when I had first started my studio. Like right. by the time I left the campaign, I had like a, a list of clients as long as my arm. Like I, I had no shortage of clients. And so I was able to use that to really build my business and like sustain and, and keep my studio going uh, for nine years, you know, after that. So you would say like building relationships was just as, if not more important than being actually like just a great designer? Oh, it absolutely was more important because the thing, and, and maybe this is the Atlanta market, although I would, I would juxtapose this to probably any, I'd say any setting. I don't want to say just any urban or modern like you know, mm -hmm. setting, but relationships are so important. You have to have people that are going to be advocating for you when you are not in the room. Yeah. The chances are, well, I mean, the reality is you can't be in every room. It's physically impossible. But outside of that, you know, just because you have, a bunch of pretty pictures on your portfolio website, that doesn't necessarily mean that that speaks for you as a designer or as a developer or, you know, whatever your creative path is. Having those people that can advocate for you, that can really sort of almost sponsor you in a way mm -hmm. um, to say like, I advocate for this person, or we should reach out to this person. 
is so important. And I don't think I would have gotten that if I wouldn't have worked that campaign. One, I think because politics is just inherently schmoozy like that. Like you just have to get used to it. Um, but also it's about sort of building a coalition. It's about maintaining trust. It's about keeping your word. It's about being honest. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those are things that, I mean, they ring true in politics, but they ring true in business as well. I would say they ring true with any sort of kind of service provider slash vendor relationship that you have. Mm-hmm. And so working that campaign really allowed me to see that up close and personal. And then I could take that and utilize it in my own business. Right. I co-signed that a hundred percent. When I, I thought that my fancy design degree would get me the universe and, uh, you're right. I had nobody advocating for me because I was terrible at building relationships while I was in school. So, um, yeah, I would just show up with my portfolio and they were like, Oh, you went to this school. Nice. Okay. See you later. (laughs) Yeah. Cause like they don't know what the reputation of that school was, or even if you've done like a specific design technique or something, clients don't care about that. They care about the end result. They care about, did this make more money? Did this get me more business? Did this get me more leads? They don't really care about, and that was something that was a reckoning to me, I'd say early on in my you know, studio career was like, clients really don't care about the process. Mm-hmm. They largely do not care. Right. There are some clients that really want to be along for every step of the ride, which I get that. A large majority of them do not care. As long as you are being like, prompt as long as you're on your word as long as you're delivering what they ask for that's really all they care about right right yeah yeah and i i i want to step that back a little bit too it's like so for all of you who are in design school i'm not saying it doesn't matter i'm saying while you're there take advantage look around the people you're with those are the people you build relationships with who are going to be able to speak for you later and you're going to be able to speak for them and you know, use your teachers, use everybody, use every relationship you can to learn and to grow yourself. Cause trust me, it's lonely out there. Once you, um, you know, don't take these relationships for granted. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, those relationships are going to be better than any Facebook ad campaign that you might run or, or any sort of, you know, fad guerrilla marketing that you try to do those relationships are what's going to sustain you, especially in the times when business is not booming. Yep. Yes, indeed. So uh, you received Stephen Haller Prize for uh, cultural commentary and from AIG in 2018. You were also named number 60 in the Roots 100 most influential African Americans in 2018. Like, how does it feel to be acknowledged at this higher level in, in the industry? (laughs) Oh, <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a sobering feeling. I'll say that. So for the Stephen Heller prize, it's interesting because that's normally a prize for writing mm. and the people who have generally won that prize are writers, they're authors, they're columnists. I am a writer, but like, that's not why I got the prize. I got the prize for the podcast. Mm -hmm. Um, and just being able to talk to these many people and share their stories and especially coming from an organization like AIGA, which, you know, to be a hundred percent honest, does not have the best track record with black people. No, it doesn't. (laughs) Um, it is, is sort of a a thing. It's sort of a, I'd say it's sort of a testament to the fact that the work in this case speaks for itself, but also that there were people that advocated for me because that's an award that's chosen by my peers. So it's not something that i it's not like a, a Webby or something where you have to buy into it in order to get a chance to be nominated or anything like that. Like that was strictly like a peer industry award. Um, the Route 100 was very interesting and I, I regret not being able to go to the gala at the time. But uh, the interesting thing about the Route 100 is that a lot of the work that I have done, whether it's the Black Weblog Awards or Revision Path, uh, and I hate to say this, it has largely been ignored by black media. Uh-huh. Like when I was doing the Black Weblog Awards, like NPR was on it. Uh, like the M- NPR really was in the early days of the Black Weblog Awards, like from 2007 to like 2009. I, I really, I really strongly feel like NPR jacked some of the winners of the Black Weblog Awards. And just to took make them, a, featured them. 
from yeah and like featured them on segments and made a show <laughs> and like if that's the case that's great because it's not about me it's about them like it's their work that got them there i'm just like the platform that does that uh but like even like when doing revision path like you know i've been in the game now for seven years i hadn't heard anything from you know ebony or essence mm -hmm. or you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, so okay. black media, like black media had largely ignored a lot of what I was doing. And, and I say ignore to the point where I know that we were reaching out to them. Like we were hitting up reporters, we were sending press releases, sending pitches, stuff like that. And just not hearing anything back. Similarly, it was the same way kind of with design media too. Like we would get a pickup here and there, but nothing like super substantial. Uh, so to get both of those in the same year is like okay the design community is looking out for me the black community is looking out for me so i'm like it's a, it's a sobering feeling to, to for both of those to happen in the same year because it felt like okay so it, it's it's making a difference it's like people are paying attention that's good to know <laughs> yeah i'm trying you know what man i i can relate in some ways and i'm trying I'm trying not to wear that chip on my shoulder, but I, I tweeted something recently about, I think that chip on my shoulder I have from not getting acknowledged by groups I feel like I should be acknowledged by almost propels me to do more sometimes. <laughs> um, but like when you do start to get acknowledged, it is a weird feeling. It, it doesn't feel like, sometimes it feels like you think, oh, we're going to kick the door down and be like, I'm here, bitches. But it's like, no, it, for me anyway, it felt like, whoa, they, they, they see me now. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's very, very interesting. Um, but yo, congratulations though. Cause that like those, that's like the highest level. And, and, you know, people pay attention to the, to what the root says from, you know, the perspective of the quote unquote culture. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so that, that's a good look. And like, I'm a big design nerd too. So when I saw the AIGA thing, I was like, whoa, like that's, that's crazy. Um, what do you feel like is next? Do you feel like after you've done something like that, it's like you've, your work is done? Oh no, no, not by a long shot. Um, in terms of what I feel like is next, I think there's a couple of things. So one, Certainly, I want revision path, or at least the the concept of it, to be in schools more. Mm. Because one thing that I I certainly have gathered from interviewing, you know, so many people on the show is that college uh, was such a a crucial point for them into their I wouldn't even say their discovery as a black designer, but just their discovery that design was something that they could do, whether it's for a living or whether it was something that they were good at college was like the nexus point of like okay that was then this is now mm -hmm. and so what would it mean if something like revision path was a part of curriculum whether in design schools or design programs at other schools etc in a way where they could learn about these other people in the industry that are doing these things you know and and then they know that it's something that they it can really aspire to or something that they can do as opposed to you know them having to learn about it. Like I get so many students that will write me that are like, oh, I'm doing a project and I'm researching and I found revision path, which is great. I love that. Like I, I love that that's the, you know, that's the case. You know, the next generation of designers coming up are looking at revision path, not just as, oh, it's this podcast, but like it's a resource. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a destination for me to find out about so many other people that do this thing that I do. Because I think also for folks that might be coming into college that, you know, either have that design knowledge or whatever, like that's where they want to figure out what the next step is. Like they wouldn't be going to design college or going into a design profession if they're like not serious about it, at least in some way. Yeah. And so then to be able to find this resource of all these people now that look like you that are doing all these different, varied, interesting things. It's like, Whoa, like what are the possibilities that can happen now from that? that wouldn't have existed, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, et cetera. Yeah. So I, I want like revision path to be like part of the design culture. That's dope. I, I love that. And I'm going to keep it 100 with you. Like uh, I follow almost everybody that you interview, uh, uh, you know, whatever they're doing and, and try to connect with them on some level, whether it's just like liking their posts or 
whatever. Um, and I feel like you're creating, you've creating a community actively that is just ever growing and we're connecting outside of revision path. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'll likely reach out to some of them for interviews on my podcast as well too. So the network will continue to grow mm -hmm. and, um, getting it into the school systems would be that much more powerful for that possibility model for these you know, young black creatives coming up who didn't know that people like them exist. If I knew, like when you interviewed the dude that did the, like the black Panther stuff, that was like, wow. Legendary. Um, oh, Handel. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And just hearing like some of the stuff that people are involved in from like Nike and, and like some of that behind the scenes things that you just like, I was, a, I was familiar with that Opara before, but like, I never really um, got to, he, well, he was, he's one of the few people that <laughs> the white design establishment kind of embraced. So, I mean, I did hear about him, but like, mm -hmm. just like others that, uh, you know, you don't realize how much impact some of us are having behind the scenes that I kind of wish I knew of, you know, when I was coming up and um, it's, I thank you for, for doing that. And uh, actually speaking of that, are there any episodes that particularly stand out for you? It, it's funny you mentioned the Eddie Opar episode because his, his sticks out to me because that was, I've been trying to get that interview since I started Revision Path. Like that was several years in the making of trying to make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, to the point where I had befriended other people that worked there <laughs> to see if I could like, if they could just like, just put a, just put my card on his desk, like, <laughs> just so he knows that I exist. Cause like I hadn't, cause you know, he's a partner at Pentagram and, and Eddie largely does not have like a, a online social presence. Oh. So I was like, how am I supposed to find like, cause he doesn't have a website. I can't find an email address. How am I supposed to reach out to him? You know, I could do it through, through Pentagram, but like, that's work. Like, uh, you know, so when we finally got that interview and I mean, <laughs> I was so ecstatic to get the interview for starters, there were like a lot of technical difficulties that were happening. He was, he was in this room. He was, uh, and when you listen to the episode, you'll hear, it sounds like he's in this big echoey room. He was in this conference room. Okay. And so it's like bouncing off the walls. Cause he's very far away from the microphone. Um, but then also like, people were coming into the room for meetings and like I was having issues on my end, but I remember asking him in that interview. And I asked this, I think also of Gail Anderson and I think I might've asked Bobby Martin too, mm -hmm. the same thing. I was like, you know, when people look up black designers, like your name is like near the top of the list, if not at the top, mm -hmm. like, you occupy this very rare air in the design community that a lot of black designers will never get to breathe. Like yeah. one, what does that feel like? Like, are you cognizant of that? And two, what are you doing to like help the designers under you? Mm -hmm. Because you've gotten to that point. It's like, so are you like, what are you doing to help out the next generation? You know? Yeah. Um, so Eddie's, Eddie's interview really sticks out to me. Uh, I mean, there's a lot that do for very different reasons. Um, oh my goodness. What's one that, that I'm trying to think of one recently that I did that stuck out. Uh, my interview with Dantley Davis, who's the VP of design at Twitter. That was a really good interview. Um, oh, my interview with Hannah Beekler, of course. She's right. a uh, Academy Award winning production designer for Black Panther. That was one where like I had to track down her PR rep and then she changed companies and then I found another PR rep and you know, like it, it all managed to come together. And like when it did, and I was actually not even able to just talk to her about black Panther. Cause I, I wanted to go into the interview, not talking just about that. Right. I'm like, everyone has talked to you about this movie. You've had a whole life before, before you did this movie. <laughs> yeah. Like let's talk about that. Like let's talk about you growing up in Ohio, getting your start in horror Mm -hmm. And then meeting Ryan Coogler and then getting involved in like the cycle of movies under him, meeting Beyonce, <laughs> you know, like, I want to know, like, how are you handling all this leading up to this? Cause yeah. you know, it's, it's one thing to sort of get the big break and then 
people think, oh, well, that's all you know. You know, people tend to think like that's all you're known for. Like, oh, you're just known for this one thing. I'm like, you were a whole person mm -hmm. before you got this accomplishment. Like, let's talk about that. So that was a really good interview. There's a, there's a lot that are good for just different reasons. Um, if, if I could even think like my early, early interviews, like I, my interview with Emery Douglas uh, was really impactful because uh, <laughs> one, I've always known about his work. Like I saw his work growing up. I saw it in the libraries and stuff like that. He's a minister of culture for the Black Panther Party. He's also an AIGA medalist. And I found, I got in contact with him because I saw there was a company in Oakland that was using his designs on like skateboard decks. Mm -hmm. And I had like wrote them and asked, you know, just like offhand if they possibly knew him or could put me in contact with him because I wanted to interview him. And like the guy that was running the company was like his grandson, I think his Jeez. grandson or his nephew or something, one of his family members, essentially. And like, gave me, gave me Emery's phone number. And we talked on the phone for like over an hour and recorded that interview just like on a Sunday, no big deal. Mm -hmm. Like I'm it, just legendary wild for like a bunch of different reasons. And I, and I have to say, you know, <clears throat> even for having done 300 plus episodes, I, I, I don't want people to get the perception that for me, this is easy mm -hmm. and like, Oh, well you've done 300. So everybody wants to talk to you. That's not the case. Uh -huh. <laughs> a lot of people will not talk to me at all because of the premise of the show. Uh, because they're like, Oh, you know, you just want to talk to me because I'm a black designer. And it's like, well, that's not the only reason, but that is the focus of the show. Yeah. Like it's about you as a creative and the work that you've done. So, you know, and then some people just don't want to be, on a podcast, you know, some people, like you said, don't feel like they're ready. Like I get a lot more no's than yeses. Mm -hmm. So I'd say it's probably like 80% no, 20% yes, in terms of like when I reach out to people. So it's, it's not easy to keep it going and to have sustained it for this long. So I don't want anyone to look at that number and think that I just got people on speed dial. Like, no, I, I still do a lot. <clears throat> I still do a lot of cold emailing. Mm -hmm. uh, just to reach out to people like, Hey, I'm such and such. Most people never get back to me. Mm -hmm. Some people get back to me a year later. Like it's, it's wild. So <laughs> no, I, I feel you. I've been listening to your, um, you know, you talk about this kind of thing on your show and I'm experiencing it as well where, um, and thank you for responding to me <laughs> as quickly as you did, because, uh, you know, I've reached out to a few, it took me a while to feel confident enough to reach out to people that, you know, are beyond just my immediate um, circle and you know, people who I just legit or like, I respect that person. They're operating at the highest level, like design famous types. And you're one of them. And I feel I've reached out to a bunch and same thing. Like they don't get back to me, which no surprise. I mean, they're, they're big time. A couple others have surprisingly said, yeah, I'll do the show. And then there are people who I'm, I'm, I'm of the same belief of you that I like to reach out to people at various stages in their career, just because it's just more interesting. Mm -hmm. And people who haven't really accomplished a whole lot don't even get back to me or they say they'll get, they'll love to do it and then never come around to book in a time or. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't that, is very, that is very common. I get a lot of folks are like, yeah, I'd love to do it. And then they never actually do it. Like they never booked the time. I'll, I'll reach out to them two or three times, never hear anything back. And it's like, what happened? What happened to that enthusiasm? So, yeah. 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 So I, f I feel you. And uh, I'm at the point now where I realize I have to get ahead on my episodes because I can't uh, bank on, oh yeah, they said they'll do it and I'll just schedule it and record it that week and upload it that same week. Nah, nah. <laughs> I got to be ahead just in case people cancel or just don't show up or flake out for whatever reason so yeah like it, it just helps out because then you can plan or you can try to plan for future you know campaigns or if you want to do like a themed month or something like that it just helps out so like for example we're recording this now in like late january mm -hmm. i already know i'm gonna be gone for half of february like i'll be in la yeah and so i've already got episodes recorded that'll go out when i'm not necessarily recording because I know that I can sort of take, it sort of lets me take breaks between, you know, certain things. So it doesn't, 
the appearance is that I am going every week, which I am, mm -hmm. but I may not necessarily be producing every week. Yeah. So yeah. For real. Yeah. That kind of bit me in the ass in the summer last year. Cause I was away camping limited internet. And I was like, I'm just going to have to not release an episode this week. Cause I don't have one. <laughs> uh, and then over the holidays this year too, it was the same thing. I got backed up and I just couldn't. So um, yeah, I learned that lesson and I'm um, staying ahead. Yeah. Uh, so Maurice, um, where can people find you online? So people can always find me at my website, which is mauricecherry.com, M-A-U-R-I-C-E-C-H-E-R-R-Y.com. I'm also on Twitter, just at Maurice Cherry. And then if you want to follow Revision Path, Revision Path is at revisionpath.com. And we're also on Twitter and Instagram, just search for Revision Path. All right, Maurice, thank you very much for uh, doing our Pays Me. And, um, you know, again, I have to really thank you for being a, a large influence on me as a podcaster and, and also just being, you know, creating this community that I've been able to, to plug into. And uh, congratulations on all your success. Thanks, man. It's been a pleasure. Thank you again for having me on your show. Thank you so much for listening to the Art Pays Me podcast. Thank you to Lange Beats for the theme music. If you got anything out of this show, please rate, review, and subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. The more you do this, the more reach the podcast gets, and the more artists I can help learn to make a living at what they love. If you want to know more about what I do, hit me up at artpaysme.com or at artpaysme on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and Pinterest. See y'all next time.